Well, today we're very fortunate to have an expert from Cox Smith to speak about the compliance side of the Affordable Care Act, what you can get away with and what you can't get away with, and then all the penalties that, that might, uh, might come about if not done correctly. And, and from a, a chamber's standpoint, we continue to hear many comments from uh, our small and medium-sized businesses about how they might get around the Affordable uh, Care Act and what creative changes that, that might uh, occur or could occur uh, in order to uh, maybe uh, opting out. And, uh, and so I, I think when we, when we think about policies and, and regulations at the government level, we, we probably think about, well, okay, does it really have to be done that way? Well, I, I think that goes, across, it goes kind of through all of our minds. You know, when we file our taxes every year, you know, how, how much into the gray area do we go you know, before, before saying, well, we don't want to go any further because we might, in fact, actually get caught? Well, you know, I think a lot of that has to do, I think a lot of that thinking is going to, going to be a part of the Affordable Health Care Act. And, and so um, it's good to have some legal advice about, about what you can and, and can't do. And, and so Joshua is here to talk about that legal side of this new health care environment and, and what your businesses uh, really uh, should be thinking about when, when dealing with the ACA. And as a leader of, uh, of Cox Smith's employee benefits, ERISA, and tax practice groups, Josh assists uh, clients with, with really difficult tax and employee benefit issues and challenges facing businesses today, including employee benefit plans, you know, tax-exempt organizations, and business tax planning. And he also helps um, clients understand the, the legal conundrums commonly encountered uh, while helping uh, while, while, while dealing with the Internal Revenue Service and ERISA, and then also developing practical strategies about how to meet the obligations around those organizations. And additionally, and I'm very, really happy to say this because I've known Josh for some time, he's been named by Best Lawyers as a San Antonio Employee Benefits Law Lawyer of the Year in 2013. And I've had the good fortune uh, to work with Josh uh, in some non-for-profit organizations. And the thing that I really, truly am impressed about Josh on an ongoing basis is his ability to make the language understandable. And it's certainly you've heard a lot of language already today that might not be as understandable as you'd like it to be. And Josh has this talent for bringing it into sort of common vernacular that we either can understand enough to ask a question about um, or we truly do understand it. And that's a gift. And, and when I talk about interaction, be mindful, uh, and Josh will tell you this as well, that this is an interactive session. I, I don't think Josh will have any problem with you raising your hand and asking a question at any time. Because if we're really truly going to benefit from his intelligence and his experience, then uh, you, you should be prepared. And please do ask questions throughout the presentation. And so it's my, it's my, indeed my very sincere pleasure to welcome Josh to the, to the microphone. Um, in full disclosure, I, Jeff is one of my mentors, so it's very flattering for me that he introduced our Jeff in this time with Thank you. But since he did a good job, I'm not going to go on about me. I'd like to get right to the core of the subject, but a few things first. I was raised by two older sisters who always told me women are smarter, and Joanna proves that to me every time I hear her speak. Um, so, and, and it's always tough. I really appreciate the chamber for what you do, but I'll pay you back for making me follow Joanna. I will. I don't know how yet, but I'll do it. Uh, Richard Perez, check your tires on the way out. Okay. So um, I would like to jump right in, but honestly, I have to do my disclaimers, as Joanna warned you. And of course, it has to be a very small print and hard to read, because no good lawyer should give you anything unless it's got a good disclaimer on it. And this disclaimer says, I'm not your lawyer today. Uh, I'm here in an educational capacity to help you with health care reform. But don't get me wrong, I would love to be your lawyer. So uh, feel free to call me at any time. But for today, um, this is meant to be educational. Jeff's right, I love questions. If you ask me a question, it really helps me to articulate the, the issues and it shows me uh, you know, that probably somebody else in the room has the same question. So you're helping me, I was a teacher in a former life. 
So to me, questions are really the best educational tool there is out there. But most people don't like to ask questions in a public setting. That's okay. That's why I put it on a screen. I uh, guess you, you don't have it in front of you. I can get it for you to have it in front of you. But if you hear it and see it, something usually sticks. Um, the other caveat I have is you can see that, that our colors at Cox Smith are blue. Um, don't take that as meaning we're a blue state or a red state. Don't take any of my comments today to be anything other than trying to project what the, I think the law is. So if you feel like I'm being political one way or the other, I apologize, it's not intentional and don't take it that way. However, if you buy me lunch, or even better if you buy me drinks, I will tell you what to do until you're ready to pay the bill and leave. So um, on that note, I, I jump right in, and, and I'm gonna kind of, I, I, I'm gonna go with the flow on this one, because it's how I want you guys to do it. Seriously, throw me any questions you want. Um, if it's about healthcare reform, I'll probably answer it. If I can't, I'll send you an email to keep your court. If it's about any other law or anything else, I'll give my off-the-cuff response and we'll go from there. But seriously, ask me any questions you want, but I'm going to kind of just throw you into left field. Because I was told this is compliance. And so I have to make you guys understand the compliance, the legal compliance side of healthcare reform. So I'm going to totally leave healthcare reform behind and jump to what came in in 1974. The Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974 which brought fiduciary duties, the highest duties under the law, onto every employer who sponsors a group health plan. So wow, we've had these and you've been under them for a long time, but I'm gonna tell you that if you follow ERISA's duties, and you follow those legal standards that we know a lot about, we have a lot of case law on, we've had it for more than 30, 40 years now, but I'm gonna have to go up almost 50. Let me tell you, that's a great body of knowledge and law for us to look to to help you comply with what Joanna absolutely said to perfectly. We're on a road, but we've never been on this road before. So from a compliance side, that scares the you know what out of me, right? Uh, I like to sleep well at night, and I like my clients to sleep well at night. So I like to get to something that we all feel very comfortable with. And so when healthcare reform came, I had to make a lot of trips to my doctor uh, over the anxiety and the worry that it was causing me and I realized that everybody in this room has probably had a little bit of that anxiety and worry along the way. And so my recommendation is not to use medication, but to use ERISA. And how so? ERISA says this, generally, if you're prudent, if you're careful, you're loyal, and you're reasonable, most likely the law will protect you. And remember what I said, ERISA calls you a fiduciary. So if you're responsible for the group health plan, or any other ERISA plans, then you're already supposed to be doing these things. But I'll tell you, if you do them, it is going to help your lawyer defend you if anything goes wrong. Okay? And I say that because fiduciaries, by the way, in my mind, you have a big red target on your back. And as a target, why is that? Because you have the highest duty under the law. What's a duty? You owe something to someone else. So don't only think about your duties, but think about who your duties belong to, and it is not you, individually. It is not the company you work for. How bizarre is that? You work for a company, you're an agent of that company, you have duties to that company, but fiduciary duties trump your agency duties to your employer. Fascinating to me, the lawyer. Sorry, you guys are all like, what's this guy talking about? Crazy <laughs> <laughs> So I want you to focus that way as we get into it, and I'm not really going to spend a lot of time on my slides. Uh, and the reason why is what I've done for you is a chronological order. Let's start out here with what's an exchange. Again, you're going to get so much detail. You already have from Joanna, and she does a better job than I do. The breakout sessions are where you can really get into the nitty gritty. So I'm going to say about 30,000 feet. And I'm going to go through all of the things chronologically that I want you to think about, and it's a bullet form, which makes my presentation fairly easy. Why? Is because as a fiduciary, I don't think there's any possible way you can spend just three hours today listening to us and meet those duties. I think it's a process. I think it's a long, continually process that you do day in and day out, right? Because if you're reasonable, I call reasonable doing your homework. What's doing your homework? It's not my 11-year-old last night at 11.30 telling me he has 10 pages of, of things that he needs to do before this morning. It was a lovely night. It's up. <laughs> it's getting the assignment, and we're giving it to you. It's been given to us. We know what the assignment is. And start now and take the first thing. Might want to start with something easy. Might want to start with something hard. But go through it and study it. 
And how do you study it? You go to the breakout sessions this afternoon. You're going to have the best experts in the land, I believe, give you, spoon, spoon feed you all the information for each one of these. Okay? So you're already on the right track. Congratulations. Everybody should pat themselves on the back because you're already doing the right thing and heading in the right direction as a fiduciary. So what are the things that I want you to look around? You know what? Joanna did it perfectly. The marketplace is supposed to look like Travelocity. And the one question that you all have in your flip open uh, brochure that was put here, and it's right above my ugly mugshot, is if I have 50 employees or less, let's just make it really easy, 49 employees or less, does this apply to me? And I think Joanne and I would look at you and say, what's this? What do you mean by that? But I thought, you know what, that's not being a good lawyer. A good lawyer would tell you it depends. <laughs> and I'm sick of good lawyers. So I want to go back to what Joshua Sutton would say. And the answer is no. This does not apply to you, but this is the employer penalty and the uh, sh employer shared responsibility, which we'll get into today. That one sliver of health care reform that is the penalty that will hit an employer. So you don't have to offer health insurance at all. And if you're truly under 50, and Joanna said it perfectly, you need to understand what 50 is and what ALE is, and make sure that you really are not an ALE. So I'm assuming that you can truly tell me, I've done the analysis, I work with Joanna, she has proven to me, we've done our chart, we've done our ATME, everything. I am not an ALE. And if you tell me that, I will tell you you are not subject to those penalties, the employer penalty. The sledgehammer, the tag hammer, 4980H, A, B, whatever you want to call it. But that's just one sliver of healthcare reform. You still have to understand everything else about it because there are other parts that will apply to you. And by the way, I'm not one who believes in the ostrich method. The ostrich method is you stick your head in the sand and hope it goes away. On the opposite, even if you are under 50, my belief is no, you still need to study the entire thing. Why? You're still a fiduciary. And if you don't understand it, as you grow and go over 50, what happens? Or what about all those other slivers of healthcare reform or mandates, what I could call chapters in the book? So, no, I can answer that question like a bad lawyer and say the answer is no, it will not apply to you for that little mugshot question. But I would not get out your cell phones, I wouldn't get up to go eat your breakfast now because I think you really want to hear and study and learn the rest of it. Um, I think Joanna did a great job on that. If you guys have specific questions about the exchange, let me know. But for most of us in this room, I believe, I could be wrong, we're employers who have health insurance. So it's really going to be your employees who are out there looking at the exchange. But as an employer, I would tell you, you better be very careful and you better understand the exchange. Here's why. Is Unless you do what Joanna said, so here's your compliance tip. If you can show me that you as employer have a group health plan that offers minimum essential coverage, it is minimum value, it is affordable, and you offer it to all full-time employees, it's what Joanna told you on her slides, just what you're going to get later this afternoon. If you can tell me that's your plan, none of your employees will be able to get a subsidy in the exchange. Okay? But if you don't offer that, or even if you do, there is a ton of information that your employees and the federal government will need from you in order to get this task done. Whether they need a subsidy or not, whether you offer insurance or not, you are going to have to deal with the exchange. How? The first one is our notice. Right? Joanna told you about it. I've got it somewhere on here. October 1st of this year, whether you offer insurance or not, and as long as you have two or more employees, the Fair Labor Standards Act says you need to send a notice out to your employees, okay? Go look at that notice because if you have not, you are behind the eight ball. Because there's a lot of information that you need to put on that form that you can't just pick up out of thin air. You have to understand minimum value. You have to understand affordable because you're represented on there. You have to pull out your plan and tell me who you cover. How many people here who are responsible for a group health plan can tell me that they can go and pull the group health plan out right now and read the definition of eligibility? Give me a show of hands. You can pull your plan document out and good for you. You're a brave boy, and I'm going to believe you because you're brave. 
But the point is, is, even if some of you were going to raise your hands and it was a small number, that is a breach of your fiduciary duties. Why? Because one of my fiduciary duties is you've got to follow the plan document. Right? So I already pointed out to you that just by the fact that you need to do this notice, you now have a great question to take back to your HR team and to talk to who your fiduciaries are and say, where is the plan? And for you 50 and unders, you have it even worse. Because the health insurance companies are not motivated economically to help you in this compliance area. You're on your own. Your best bet are your worthies of the world, your brokers, who are motivated to help you get through this and comply. And so I encourage you, before you pick up the phone and call your lawyer, because we fill at a higher rate typically than we're them, <laughs> I would have you go to your vendors, who you're already paying for this service, and who are extremely knowledgeable. Look, what's a fiduciary duty? Careful, reasonable, prudent. To me, going out from your little area of world and finding experts and asking them questions, getting their knowledge and bringing it back into your circle, and studying it, is there no better way to prove to me you're being a good fiduciary? I'd say no. But don't jump to the lawyers. We also, another fiduciary duty is reasonable costs. I don't want you to go out and spend a million dollars to conform with health care reform. I would tell you you're breaching your fiduciary duty. But how much does it cost for you to pick up the phone and call Joanne and say, hey, what does this mean and why? Can you send me information on it? She listed for you, at the end of her presentation, some amazing resources. If you do not take this back to your HR department and make sure they have studied that, I think you have failed as a fiduciary. And it's not that hard. It really isn't. It's not hard to ask a question, get the answer, and file it away. So here is, you can leave after this one right here. Document, document, document. I can see some faces in here have heard me before, so I'm sorry for the repetition. I apologize, but thank you. Document, document, document. What does that mean? It means you show me why you're doing it. You show me what you did to figure out why you're doing it. And then you know what I want you to conclude with? This is how great I am for doing it. Because that's what a fiduciary does, right? So what is it? I need to understand healthcare reform. Go get your plan document and go start asking questions. But it's in the interest of your participants. So the question should not be coming from Joshua Sutton, shareholder of Cox Smith, how much is this going to cost me at the end of the year? Now, don't get me wrong, there's business to this. And I'm not saying you ignore the business side, but your first fiduciary duty is not to your pocketbook. And it is not to your fellow shareholders. It's always hard for me as a lawyer knowing I have a duty to my other shareholders. My duty is the plan participants. It's a fiduciary duty. Okay? So when you're asking those questions and when you're documenting, the question should be how am I going to offer health care reform to our participants, to our employees? And what is in the best interest of the employees when I do this? Now, I know it's Pollyanna to say all decisions would be made that way, but I'd sure like to see you document it that way to start out. Now, does fees come into it? Absolutely. Do I want you to lie, cheat, or steal when you're documenting? Absolutely not. That defeats the purpose. So I'm not asking you to make it up, and I'm not asking you to do something that is wrong. I'm just saying put down when you do it right. Document. Okay? Why? Because if I have to defend you in a lawsuit, or more likely, if I have to help you through an audit by HHS of your plan, or DOL, or IRS, all three can easily come in at any day and ask to see your plan document. So for all of you who could not raise your hand when I said, where is your plan document? Your real fear should be when the IRS sends you a letter and says, I want to see all of these documents in my office within a week. And let me tell you, if you cannot produce everything perfectly, you're already on the wrong track. You're already setting yourself up for a long, exposed problem. First is a good fiduciary looks at an IRS or a DOL or an HHS audit and says, bring it on. You're a waste of my time, but here's a room, here are all the records, ask me the questions you want, let me go do my job. That's how I want you prepared for an IRS, DOL, HHS office. And if you're a fiduciary doing your fiduciary duties, you got it. It's easy. All right, so my timeline, you see I started in 2013, and it's really because I'm not going to worry about the past. We've been doing this through 2010. 
And if you need a timeline from 2010 up to today, you're really behind the eight ball. So the first thing you should do is again, call your broker, but let me know and I can send you the, the bullets for everything up to today. But what I want you to go back and do today are these things. And when you're in your breakout sessions today, it's what I want you focused on, even though a lot of it is gonna be on the employer penalty, you need to do these things in preparation for the employer penalty. We lucked out. They gave us a whole year to deal with the taxes on employers who don't offer good enough coverage or don't offer it at all. That's the way I look at it, okay? And in fact, let me totally back up and screw you all up real quick. Look what I call it. Now back to the employer shared responsibility, the tax that will hit each employer, a non-deductible penalty each year if you don't offer sufficient coverage, okay? And if you really offer junky, junky or nothing at all, there's what we call the huge sledgehammer penalty. But everybody's out there calling it play or pay, or pay or play, and I think that's a misnomer. Because I think you could pay, or you could play, and you would still hit the excise tax. But my point is, is that, coming back to what I need you to do, is that that's in 2015 now. So I don't want you to be the ostrich and stick your head in the sand into it, and by being here today, you're not, so congratulations. But I do need you to focus on these as well. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Yeah, there we go. My timeline. So starting out, you actually have until the end of 2014 to fix this new limit from healthcare reform on your cafeteria plan. So I'm actually off and I'm back over on cafeteria plans. But I'm in healthcare reform, and healthcare reform is not just your group health plan. It encompasses a lot of other things. But for employers who sponsor plans, you need to go back and amend your cafeteria plan. So take this back to HR and say, if we amended our flexible spending arrangement only, FSA, so that it's only $2,500 a month. Different plan, but that flexible spending arrangement, should you have one, is also subject to ERISA. And therefore, you're also a fiduciary over that plan. So now I go back, instead of you just going back and saying, can you show me where your group health plan is, the next question should be what? Where's your cafeteria plan? Do we have one? If so, what does it say? And I'll tell you that every single one of you who are an employer or health employers who sponsor group health insurance, you have to have a group health plan if participants pay for part of their premiums. It is called a premium only plan. It's a cafeteria plan. Okay? So everybody has to have at least that POP. But under that premium only plan, cafeteria plan, you can sponsor this flexible spending arrangement, and that's where that limit is. Okay? But if you don't know, if you can't tell me right now exactly what it is, that's one key that we need to ask you. <laughs> but two, go pull out the plan document, okay? We have a number of fees that are becoming, that are coming. Corey just hit us in July. If you're not paying a Pecori fee, you need to tell me why. Okay, so go back and ask your group, are we paying a Pecori fee? And if so, how much, where, and why? And understand what that fee is. There are many fees in healthcare reform that are helping to pay for various aspects of this Huge system, okay? Third, the exchange notice, October 1st, we talked about, then the exchange is open. And I talked about this 12-month measurement period. That, to me, again, is going back to the penalties, the employer shared responsibility penalties that we will be talking about. Your guys this afternoon are gonna really educate you on how to count employees for that purpose of that tax. And in part of counting those employees and in part of understanding how you're gonna implement your way of tracking those employees, right? You heard Joanna talking about variable employees, part-time employees, full-time, all of that is tracking and measurement periods. And if you can't show me all of your documentation on how you're doing it, then you, to me, have failed as a fiduciary, and honestly, what really worries me is you're not gonna be able to defend when a notice comes from the exchange saying, we think you owe this employer penalty. Right? Because you're going to get a notice that all of a sudden says, oh, you have a thousand employees. Guess what? Your penalty is almost $2 million, non-deductible. How are you going to pay for it? When you get that notice, what are you going to do? If you panic, we have failed. But if you say, hand this to HR, they've tracked it, we're under a safe harbor, and if I use that safe harbor, I've already documented exactly how we're doing it. And I can immediately respond back to that notice and say, this is why we do not offer that penalty at all. You, exchange IRS, have goofed. And why do I know they're going to goof? They're going to goof a bunch. Why? 
It is so complicated. And somebody said they want money. I want to go to buy this. I tend to agree with you, right? Treasury would like more dollar. But what I was going to say, although I think that's a good point, is uh, it's so complicated. It is, you, you know, the, the, the inner chart that Joanna showed us of all the eight organizations, that, well, all that I saw right there was, gosh, you know what? I mean, to have eight different organizations have to feed into that exchange, back out, up to individuals. These individuals will typically be lower income, lower socioeconomic. I don't think people in this room will be going to the exchange. That is not a comment politically, but just think about it. And so because of that, out of this chaos, you will most likely get a notice that is wrong, in my opinion, as an employer. Which is why I'm telling my clients, let's be ready for it. And if I understand the safe harbors that your guys are going to teach you this afternoon, and I implement them now, I'm a year ahead. What a great fiduciary. Ahead, a year ahead, you guys are already thinking about the measurement periods, how this tax is going to impact you, how you're going to react to it, and how you're going to protect the employees. Right? It's a penalty that hits the employer. But I don't want you thinking about this is just to avoid a penalty for tax purposes. I know that's the reality. But when you're documenting for me, you're saying we're doing this to make sure we run the most efficient, reasonable fees, carefully run, administered, prudently run, and administered plan. You can see it gets that nausea with me. I apologize up front. But I see a dearth of people doing what they're supposed to be doing when it relates to their group health plans. Now, it used to be that all I did was pension work. ESOPs, 401k plans. Have you noticed that the Congress has not been focused on our pension plans much lately? Where has all the shift gone to? Healthcare reform. So that's why all of a sudden my pension clients are on the back burner. I don't have any plan amendments. Those have been running smooth for a while. We still have our issues we do it, don't get me wrong, but I'm really, I'm not focused on them as much. I'm focused on the welfare plans. And I have been my whole career. And the reason why is we were always the stepchild in the benefits world. Nobody cared about the welfare plans. Why? There's no money, pocket of money like the pension plans, right? Your 401k plan can have millions of dollars sitting in that trust. People react when they see millions of dollars. And their fiduciary duties are up the wazoo because they see that pot of money. Nobody sees that with welfare plans. So my belief is that 99.999% of the welfare plans, insured or self-insured, are absolutely out of compliance. And if any one of you can come and show me that you are 100% compliant, I will buy you dinner at my hands. There's my pledge to you. And I'll be honored, I will not bill you a single dollar, I will come to your facility, and I'll let you walk through the whole thing. And if I can't poke one hole, a nice, and I'll let you buy that Japanese steak, <laughs> all right? Now, for you to do that, and that's really the goal I want you to be able to do, I would love for somebody to take me up on that challenge. And honestly, I'd love for them to beat me. But as you can tell, I don't think any one of you in this room can do it. So I've laid out the gauntlet, make me eat my words. Okay, I'm now to 2014. And look at all the things that hit us in 2014, okay? So I start up here, your annual limits are prohibited. So go back, make sure your plan has absolutely no annual limits. What's that? You can only do, uh, I'll only pay for medical group, major medical coverage up to a million dollars a year. Go on. Hundred thousand dollars a year for this benefit only. Go on, okay? We used to have lifetime limits. Those have been gone since 2010. Thank you. I went to Joanna. See, great. Um, but for some, then we got some waivers. But for most of us, they're gone. So go look at your plan. What a great way for you to document that you are being a good fiduciary in the best interest of participants. Thank you. Right? What are you going to do? You're going to go, you're going to read your plan document. There's one fiduciary duty. Two, you're going to look at it and say, we do annual limits, this is bad for employees, the best interest of employees, okay, the law. We're pulling it out and make sure we pull it out. Now, my hope is it's not there, it's easy, it takes you 10, 15 minutes, but then what are you going to do? You're going to go document it. Whoever said that, I had a dollar to it. Well done. Okay? So just a great example of how each one of these can be used very quickly, very efficiently, very easily for me to defend you against anyone. 
individual or government. Cost sharing limitations, this is a huge one we're gonna see, but you can only charge participants so much, deductibles, co-pays, and all adds up. Make sure you understand this. This is huge and it's very complicated. 90 day waiting period, Joanne, you gotcha. The exchanges come up, pre-existing condition exclusions go away. We've already been gone for the youngers, but now all of us will no longer have to worry about being excluded from coverage for pre-existing conditions, whether it's employer plan, exchange plan, any other governmental plan, okay? And this is fascinating to me. See, I always broke things up into ERISA, which I think most of you are, and non-ERISA, church plans, my governmental entities. Healthcare reform, blind to governmental church distinction and you guys. Healthcare reform hits the governmentals, it hits the churches. It's fascinating from a legal perspective. Wonderful. Here now, I can always, my governmentals would always have some kind of ERISA language in their plan, and I'd scream at them, how dare you? Why would somebody who's not subject to ERISA pull it in and give people the argument that you are covered? Get that out. Now, I have to go back and amend all of their legal health plans. Why? Healthcare reform ripped the claims procedures out of ERISA and stuck it on all my governmental and churches. So now, in my legal world, it blows me away. Actually, governmental and churches are subject. <laughs> Changed years of law. So, sorry, the risk of ease, I love it. But, but it's fascinating to me. You need to be aware of it. Reinsurance fees, here we get more fees. These are expensive. The individual mandate comes in. So if you're not getting coverage, Joanna hit this well, there's a tax. Non-discrimination. There are now lawsuits, hit me with five minutes, Will, whenever you see me. There are lawsuits now that are available for individuals to sue their employers, Fair Labor Standards Act. You discriminated against me because of a healthcare factor. Every one of you are now subject to a whole new area of plaintiff's litigation, okay? Now, the only one I've seen so far is the organization now has sued certain plans that do not provide for pregnancy. Makes sense for me, right? See, they're saying that's clear discrimination against women. And it hasn't resolved itself yet, but it's fascinating again from a legal perspective. So be aware of that. Okay, these HIPAA electronic rules, absolutely nobody knows about them, and it's something that I would want you to go look at and research. We actually had to be up to a certain level last year. This is the second round, there will be a third and fourth round over the years. Go figure out HIPAA. And not just HIPAA electronic operating rules, what you will really find is high tech and our privacy, security, and breach notification rule. And if you do not understand HIPAA as it relates to your group health plan, you got a lot of homework to do. And get going, on September 23rd, you need to be completely compliant with the final omnibus rule. Yes, ma'am. I didn't get one question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll explain it later. I'm coming. Yes, ma'am. I'm in HR and I'm already dishing out the exchange notice to our new hires, which I didn't feel was a bad thing to do based on John. Um, but I have uh, created an acknowledgement form and instead of providing them with a copy of our thick plan, I state that it's going to be in HR or on our web page or somewhere where they can go and view it. Is that going to be okay? Good. You've opened up a whole Pandora's box of notice requirements. Let me try to answer yours. But this is great. This woman has just given you another whole fiduciary issue that you need to think about. Do not blame the messenger. She's only trying to help us. My, my answer to you, I think, is I'm not, I think you're saying the plan document that you, you, instead of giving the plan document, you, you have to sign the acknowledgement with the notice and say, if you want the plan, come inspect it in our office. I think that's fine so long as you meet the SPD, this is ERISA requirements for the disclosure. And I would tell you that as long as you gave the SPD for free on new hire, um, that you probably are okay. I want to hear more facts from you and really, you know, flush it out. But you don't need me. Go back and read, go back and think through, ask your brokers, ask, do your Google searches. Uh, and why do people come to me? So I think, I, I'm gonna try to answer your question, I think you're okay. I would prefer that you, in that letter, that consent to individuals, I love getting signatures and acknowledgements. I'd have them consent to getting electronically. Since you're already going to that work, you can have them consent and say, yeah, you can send it to me electronically. And you can tell them that if they want it hard copy, they can request it. 
But by doing that, then you can just email it out or put it on an intranet. Now, if people don't have access to a computer, we got to probably get it to them physically. I prefer that because I know it works. Hey, there's my five. Let me really hit you with the big stuff. You guys can do your homework. My job is just to give you the assignment. I know you all hated your teachers, but it's really we're trying to help you. But if we do the work, you don't learn it, right? The best teachers are the ones that get their students to become teachers. That's what I'm hoping I do for you today. I want all of you, by the end of today, to begin the education so that eventually you will be able to teach this. Okay, look that up. You'll get a plethora of knowledge. Okay, we'll have reporting issues. This will fall on you. You'll need to help with it. So you've got another tax return and then the employer mandate. You guys will get plenty of that. Uh, this is my cost sharing slide, by the way. If you want this, just let me know and we'll get it to you. Uh, still on my timeline, uh, or sorry, the cost sharing. This is my pay or play. So I give it to you. Listen to the experts this afternoon. Joanna does a great job. They're going to get you more. After that, come let me know. Um, here are the other things I want you focused on as it relates to your group health plan. Why do people come hire me? And when they usually call me, I'll usually stop them and tell them what I told you, and that is, have you done your homework? Have you gone and researched this? Have you gotten to a point where you're stuck? Don't come to me and tell you're stuck. But the benefit is when you're stuck or when you really, really want to cross your T's and dot your I's and protect your fiduciaries, people call me because the law has blessed lawyers with the ability to write you a legal opinion or write you a memorandum that says the way you're doing it in our mind is reasonable. There is no ultimate way to prove a fiduciary is reasonable rather than having an outside professional give it to you. And lawyers get the benefit of privilege and confidentiality, and we also get the legal requirements under the Internal Revenue Code to get you out of penalties. So I'm sorry that we have an elitist system, but I joined it, and so it's helpful to me. I'm not saying you need to hire lawyers, okay? And in fact, if you do your job so well, you may not need to hire me. But when you're on that road and it's the first time and we're going down a path, you're gonna to have to make guesses. And if the guess is big enough, like a $2 million non-deductible penalty, I have a lot of people coming and saying, Josh, what do you think? And we go into a dialogue. And my clients, you're getting what my clients get. I walk through it with them and we talk about what is the law, but what is the most practical way we can get through this. Because if you're spending too much on me, I have failed you as a fiduciary. You're spending too much time with your CPA. Same thing. So my job is to make this, you know, it's our byline, and I used to think it was pretty stupid. But now I really get it. Practical advice for the real world. So it's very easy for me to get through a lecture and be in the ivory tower, but I found when I did that, people went to sleep and I was not being effective. And as a teacher in a former life, what gives me the greatest success in my own personal feeling is to know that I've sent you out and you now have a better understanding, you know what your path is, and you can go get that path done. So I really believe that that's why I try to get you guys stuff that is practical. Now you go do it. And when you get to the point where you feel like you've really got it, and if you want me to come help you through it, I would be honored to do so. All right, any last questions before they kick me out? Wow, guys, I really must have talked way, way too much and too fast. I'm not sure if that's a good sign. is um, something that I'm actually very passionate about. I think this is, um, politically or not, um, I am one who believes that um, we're in a world where there are a lot of people in our city, and in our state, and in our country who are not getting adequate medical coverage. Okay, so whatever your belief is politically, I'm going, trying to appeal to both the left and the right. I believe that we fail as a society if we are not giving the basic fundamental right of decent health coverage, okay? And the reason why I say that, because I've tried to argue both ways politically, is that I look at my four beautiful children, and I think, no matter what happens to me, I hope somebody gets to the next. And I look at my kids and I think they are blessed that I'm able to provide for them, but that a lot of people struggle in this country, yeah. and we owe it to their children to get their health coverage. 
So thanks, guys. I appreciate it, Jeffrey. Thanks, Josh. Well, excellent as always. And you know, if I if I had to take just two words away from Josh's uh, presentation, it would be obviously knowledge and discipline. And that's knowledge of everything that you really need to know about the Healthcare uh, Act, and then the discipline to follow through in virtually everything that you need to follow through on in order to make sure you're safe.